the artists in this gallery were more or less working in the same city and in the same moment as the artists in that gallery. Here you have Al Hill, William T. Williams, Jean Davis, Atsuko Tanaka, um, making work that's exploring color, that's exploring synthetic color in ways um, that are both abstract and not so abstract, in ways that are indebted in some way to the color field painting and the abstract expressionist painting that came before it, but also taking off with this kind of pop art mentality toward color that's obviously as far removed in palette as well as in its goals from what's happening in the room before it, but as I said, taking place at the exact same time and with the exact same resources of canvas and paint. Then going from the very heavy issue of history to the very light issue of whiteness and emptiness as a truck that artists have explored for really the last century. Um, here with four examples by Agnes Martin, um, Robert Ryman in New York in the 60s, Shirara Kushiari, a recent painting, and Karen Sonder a recent painting. And that painting, by the way, being nothing more than the artist's instructions that you take a white painted wall and sand it and sand it and sand it and sand it so that the glossy rectangle emerges and becomes reflective of what's going on around it instead of, obviously, an object in and of itself. You could write a book. Books have been written, more will be written, on the role of whiteness as a um, source of interest to artists, as a way of celebrating painting, as well as in some ways denying painting, like Karen does, as something that is all about spirituality, as it is with Pushiari and Martin too, really, or as something that's all about pragmatism and the reality of the object, as it is for Ryman, who has painted for almost 50 years just with white paint. And yet what it's about for him, he would say, is not white. White is not what it's about. The painting is about how you make a painting, and in this case, how you fasten it to a wall with these metal bands and screws. Again, like the sculptures that we were looking at by the um, Bondicube, Benglis, etc., in the early gallery, it's about what makes this painting into a painting. Well, it's on the wall. And it doesn't matter what that image is or how it gets onto that wall. But these are the things Ryman tests, you know, literally in thousands of all white paintings. And the idea of repetition that has obsessed artists also for the last 40 years. You have from the 1960s, these Richard Pettibone, who was making simultaneously, practically, at the moment that the artist he's copying is making his own versions, in this case, Frank Stella, tiny miniatures of famous works of art. And Richard Pettibone has been doing this also for 40 years. And so what you have is basically a little bit of a late 60s Frank Stella retrospective on one wall. Um, that same idea of repetition that happens 20 or 30 years later with Sherry Levine's checkerboards. These take what could be just called a game board um, strategy, a game board image, and turns them into paintings, generic paintings in some way, but highly personal paintings too, from the palette. And in fact, palette is a big subject in this room. You have with these Andy Warhol portraits of Lena Hornet, and Lita seriously, also serially seen in different colors. Um, the whole idea of the, um, no one authoritative text, as they would say. And this is very much brought home in Alan McCullough's surrogate paintings, which obviously make the point that painting is all about its frame, it's all about its um, hanging, it's all about the conventions that surround putting a painting on view on a wall in a gallery or a home and not about what the representation or the illustration of that painting might be. 
And just as those are blank, in fact, you could say that the repetition of the Lita Hornets or the repetition of the Stellas or the repetition of the checkerboards make all of those as meaningless in some way as these, or vice versa. We've sort of come now to the 80s, a period when a lot of young artists are reconsidering the so social context of um, art, and what that brings up, um, unsurprisingly, is text. Here you have Tim Rollins and KOS using the text in the sense of literally taking pages, in this case from the book Franz Kafka's America, as the foundation of the painting rather than canvas. Christopher Wool taking this phrase, catching the bag, bags in the river, from the movie with Tony Curtis, The Sweet Smell of Success. Um, Cats and bag was the code word if you saw the movie saying the body um, had been dumped in the river. Glenn Ligon, although you can't see it anymore, but I can tell you, taking an essay text by um, the critic Richard Dyer called White and inscribing it again and again and again and again and again, and again um, with this black paint um, such that it becomes illegible. But the whole question of white and black, um, you know, coming very much to the fore, not just in terms of paint, but in terms of all the implications that has both for text and for race in America. And Guillermo Puchka from Argentina taking a map as a text, as a found text, from which to make a painting that could be considered Elizabeth Murray with a very recent painting. Tip Dunnan, also with a recent painting, Ship of Fools, this is called Be the Dance. Robert Colescott, Emergency Room. And Martin Kissenberger from Germany, War is No Night. So here are artists using imagery that might be considered more cartoonish, taking its inspiration from um, traditions that might be considered grotesque, like German, uh, German Expressionism, the political art of Germany in the 20s, all sorts of propaganda uh, work that isn't necessarily thought of as high art. Um, looking to these traditions for their very, um, I would say, um, powerful challenge to the idea of abstract art as something serene and something as contemplative. And in each of these ways, specifically with Martin Kippenberger with War is No Night, making a point, but even in here with the um, emergency room and the Dunham and the Murray, talking about imagery as something which, even if it has a kind of fun, exuberant, peppy, colorful um, approach, looks hard at the moment in society. Brazilian painter Beatrice Milhaz, the Mexican Gabriel Orozco, and two Americans, Sarah Morris and Wade Guyton. These are all paintings that challenge the idea of the personal hand, because all of them are using found techniques or anonymous in some way imagery. In Sarah Morris's case, all sketched on a computer with computer program. A very strange and haunting painting that's, I think, particularly beautiful with the bacon in terms of body contortion. Willem Sosnal, a painter in his 30s in Warsaw, where a lot of interesting painting is actually happening right now, photographing his wife and then translating that photograph into a painting that obviously makes her look more like something like the Empire State Building. And Luke Toymans, a painter from Antwerp, whose work here is titled Demolition, but actually in New York, and you see the little clue at the bottom left of the New York streetlight that's familiar to all of this, I think for now and probably for a long time, conjures, not up, conjures up not so much a deliberate demolition of a building, but um, the attack of 9-11. I'm glad to take questions. Don't ask me what is painting. This is James Calm, coming to you from the Museum of Modern Art, reporting on what is painting. Thanks, Kate.